without further ado, Scott Manley. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, what I'm famous for, right? So yeah, I promised to make this very fast, and uh, I was really happy to see John talking about uh, nuclear thermal, turbothermal uh, rockets, whatever, because I, one of my series, I flew many spacecraft with those in a simulation. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is kind of my uh, public face. I have a day job, but uh, I do this thing on YouTube where I play video games, I do science, and uh, sometimes both at the same time, and that's a lot of fun. My first big success actually harkened back to when I was doing a PhD in astronomy. I was dealing with small bodies in the solar system. And so I put together this video in 2010 showing how asteroids had been discovered over time. And it was great because it showed you all these patterns. The flashes are where the asteroids were being discovered. And you'll see that like, they are discovered opposite to the uh, location of the Earth because you're looking outwards. There was pulsing as uh, the lunar cycle kicked in. You would see uh, things hitting, shooting out around the Trojans, various other details like that. This got millions of views, very popular. I ended up working with uh, various people that are actually seriously interested in asteroids. But you know, the bread and butter of my channel is a lot of these science type videos. I love doing, taking things like um, you know, popular culture, like uh, taking the engines from the TV show The Expanse and trying to figure out just how amazingly efficient they are. Turns out they make them as efficient as is required for the plot. Uh, figured out how much energy it takes to destroy a planet, and since most people in public don't think in terms of joules, I converted it to the energy content of the Twinkie. Um, there's a great story of how General Mills helped Russia take the first pictures of the far side of the moon. And yeah, you know, there's various other things like this. This video is surprisingly popular um, because apparently people see the thumbnail and they think that guy's standing next to a big Gatling gun. Um, but yeah, I also play uh, a lot of spaceship games. These are, you know, what... Um, well, these are some nice screenshots from things like Elite and in Call of Duty and EVE Online and No Man's Sky. Um, I love spaceship games. I've loved spaceships ever since I was like four years old and saw Star Wars. And the theme of my talk is, can, you know, can video games teach people real science? And I'm going to say, these games, not so much. But there is this game that I did kind of get go big with. It's called Kerbal Space Program. Now, what's a Kerbal? You know what a space program is? Well, a Kerbal are these three little green men. Yeah, little green men flying rockets. Who would have thought that would work? It's, uh, you know, they're kind of comical, and uh, that's good, because you're going to laugh at them a lot, especially when you, the rocket you've just built explodes, and they're screaming as they're falling towards the ground on their, without a parachute. The game uh, was produced by a Mexican company. It seems like a, a lot of things I really like come from Mexico. Uh, it was uh, released in 2011 as an early access title, and it worked from day one. Uh, it would be a few years later before they had a 1.0 release, and they've just updated it to 1.3. They've just kept on iterating on this thing. Sold a couple of million copies. It's available on pretty much every platform except for the Wii U, somebody lamented. And it was recently acquired by Take-Two Interactive, better known for um, Grand Theft Auto. So the way the game works is you drop into your vehicle assembly building and without any need for cranes or anything, you can assemble your rocket out of the various parts. You can stack tanks, engines, decouplers. You can stick your solid rocket boosters on the side and maybe add some aerodynamic features so that you can fly. And then you click, fly, and off it goes. This is obviously accelerated. But there is all the real physics you would expect from real rocket launches. You're dealing with thrust, aerodynamics, everything else. And players that play this, well, they love to copy real things. You know, here's a Saturn V. Somebody went and did a version of Apollo Soyuz. Everybody loves to build space shuttles. They're impractical, but they tend to explode a lot in the game. Um, that's actually really, probably shouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> Oops. Uh, no, space shuttles are incredibly difficult to build, which is why people keep building them, I think. Um, a lot of aviation, Mir, the International Space Station, and people just keep getting bigger and bigger. All those plans that you hear people sketching out at these events, people love to try building them in this game. 
And here's a version of a, a Mars-style spacecraft. This is something that would take a crew of six on a two-year voyage. Building bases on moons. Yeah, all this stuff is done. And this isn't just like people playing with CGI and just dropping this stuff down with a mouse click. No, they're actually flying that stuff up. They're computing their burn out to the moon. They're their capture burn, their landing, I mean, they're targeting this. Like, this is a huge amount of effort. Somebody spent 700 hours building an exact copy of the International Space Station, one launch at a time. Uh, but people also build insane things, right? You, spaceship, right? Uh, anyone a fan of Game of Thrones? Huh? Yeah, somebody built a working dragon. And today, I actually had somebody on Reddit ping me saying, uh, asking a specific question about dragon aerodynamics because of last night's episode. And I'm going to have to do some math. Anyone like Mad Max? Oh, yeah, people love to recreate their movies. Um, anyone like Japanese fighting robots? You know, yeah, somebody built this. And again, this is an animation. This is all physically modeled. I cannot fathom how much work went into that thing. Uh, but crazy things, what I've discovered is they all have real-world analogs. Well, maybe not f giant robots, but, you know, sticking uh, some rockets in a fuel tank to a chair. NASA actually studied that. They wanted a way to get their astronauts off the moon if the LEM failed. Um, yeah, you know, the man out of space, easy. You know, basically parachuting back on top of a foam heat shield. Um, rotary rockets, the, the worst parts of a helicopter and a rocket combined. <laughs> and somebody actually got a patent for this. This is the rocket catcher. They thought the best way to recover a rocket was to fly it straight down this trench and into a target two meters wide. I, I, <laughs> and, like, this looks crazy enough, but they actually included doors in it. So this was for a crude vehicle. <laughs> they were, boom, <laughs> stop. Um, but coming back, this is one of my favorite parts, the lunar escape system. So NASA, you know, obviously they were trying to minimize the weight on this. They were trying to cut down the mass, and somebody came up with a bright idea of leaving the reaction control thrusters off, reasoning that if you're standing on top of a rocket that's firing, you can kind of lean left and right to adjust your center of mass to control this thing and fly it to orbit. They actually built like a simulator. You know, so this is a guy in a suit. He's standing on a load cell there. You know, it has like little weight sensors in all four corners and it's feeding that into a simulator. So he could control it this way. So in 1970, NASA basically invented the Wii balance board. And uh, I actually integrated that into Kerbal Space Program. This is my son, Orion, and yeah, I don't have him flying a rocket, but I do have him flying a jet, and it's actually surprisingly difficult to do anything that doesn't involve crashing. But, you know, he quite enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, Kerbal Space Program, despite all this silliness, uh, it does have a lot of users, a lot of fans, let's say, throughout the rocket science you know, rocket industry, people from SpaceX. Oh yeah, we love, this is how we design our rockets according to SpaceX. Uh, yeah, NASA Sim Labs engineer also talks about how much he loves Kerbal Space Program. Tori Bruno from the ULA, yep, he loves it. Elon Musk, again, big fan of Kerbal Space Program. And if you remember the first launch out of Vandenberg of the, uh, oh sorry, the first sort of successful landing out of Vandenberg. It didn't quite go as planned, if you remember. The landing legs in the, um, the moist coastal air kind of iced up a bit. So some Kerbal fans got together and uh, came up with a plan that might help SpaceX land successfully. Everybody loves trying to do this thing because usually it involves crashing, but uh, yeah, somebody thought that having Gypsy Danger from Pacific Rim <laughs> Yeah. And again, this isn't animation. Somebody is actually driving this. Somebody wrote an AI, wrote a like, you know, guidance system for this and everything. It is stunning the amount of work people put into this. The game, yeah, it's built on a physics simulation. Unlike many space-type simulators, or many flight simulators, the vehicle is not a single entity, right? It's actually made up of a lot of individual components. And the game is calculating the motion, the forces, the aerodynamics, the joint strengths on all these parts individually. It's actually, you know, like your rocket is in fact a bunch of parts flying in very close formation. 
Um, and so the way I like to illustrate this with an example, this is supposed to be uh, something like an SR71, uh, but what happens if you stall the turbine on one, style, one side? Yeah, you know, it yaws off and it breaks up and disintegrates. Uh, this actually did happen to a real life um, SR-71 and unfortunately only one of the crew survived. So anyway, the power of Kerbal Space Program, I think, uh, is that it does build this sandbox that lets you build things, it lets you experience things, and it lets you make mistakes. And everybody makes mistakes. This is one of my favorite pictures. It shows, of course, uh, Goddard. And you may not know that some of it is early rockets. They put the rocket engine up there because they thought that would make the rocket more stable. This is something that I hear a lot. Everybody's posting about rockets. Oh, you should put it up the top. It's more stable. It's like, actually, that's called the pendulum rocket fallacy. If you, you line up all the vectors, as soon as it's free, it's no more stable than having the rocket engine at the bottom. Uh, there's these guys, Gemini 4, right? Gemini 4 was the first spacewalk. But as part of that, or there was an earlier mission opportunity. They wanted to turn the spacecraft around and rendezvous with the upper stage booster. And, uh, you know, this wasn't part of the mission, or wasn't part of the original plan. They, they had it there. They thought, let's, you know, let's put this into the mission plan. And they, they tried. They flew around for 90 minutes, unable to get close, because they didn't understand orbital mechanics. They were flying it like an aircraft. They flew towards it. And that meant they slowed down, which meant they fall, fell down and they accelerated away. And, and you know, yeah, this is, uh, of course, it took Buzz Aldrin to explain how orbital rendezvous should actually work. Um, and this is a, one of my favorite uh, cartoons from uh, XKCD. You know, this guy, he did work at NASA. <laughs> and he does this strip every day. And it, this is absolutely true. I've met this, I've met so many people that have worked at NASA that said they did not understand orbital mechanics. And they still make this mistake. Like, Oh, if I slow down, I'll go backwards. No, you slow down, you go forwards. If you accelerate, you go backwards. It, like, blows people's minds, and people make that mistake every day, even people that have been working in the business. So you have the opportunity to learn Newton's laws, the rocket equation, Kepler's equation. You don't need to know any of this stuff, but you can, you know, this is all stuff that works within the game. Aircraft stability. I didn't know anything about aircraft stability until I tried building one, and they would backflip all the time. Um, so, yeah, so you have this environment, we have uh, limitations, or sorry, restrictions that were placed on it to make the thing more, the gameplay more accessible, right? So, where there is a decision between realism and gameplay, the designers say gameplay wins. So, the ion engines, for example, we know they take months and months to accelerate things. Now, you can do it in like 25 minutes. So it still takes a long time, but it's not months and months and months. They have nuclear engines. They have a, uh, you don't have to worry about engines you know, uh, having to have their fuel settle, for example. You don't have to worry about their throttle ranges. You know, it's definitely made very simple. They also make the planets and the moons about 10 times smaller. Because you know, it actually means you've got a half hour orbit, you can do things a lot faster. But, you know, gamers being gamers, they ask for mods and people develop mods. There's full-scale solar system that works with all these things that were disabled. You have to make your, end, your fuel settle correctly. You have to make sure that you've got correct ratios. Your cryogenics are evaporating. Yeah, people do all this stuff. But I think my point about all this is that people that play these games, they, they become problem solvers. And it's kind of what everybody that writes up these mission proposals is doing. You're trying to solve the problems. It's just these you know, players do this within a video game. And everybody that's playing this is solving these problems. Uh, you know, I, I like to point out that you know, traditional media, books, films, or whatever, they are less interactive. You know, you can certainly uh, experience that you can get ideas from it, but you can't really change it. You might go off and write a blog post about how you would have solved a problem. But in games, you know, you're really, you're participating and you're paying attention. This is why you're learning. And many of the games are actually, they fundamentally boil down to optimization problems. And you'll see huge posts on the internet about how, how to solve problem X or maximize problem X. And they resemble scientific papers in many ways. 
And I, this one also is I think that game players I've encountered, they tend to treat all problems solvable by default. When they see, hear about asteroid threats or whatever, hazards, they're always like, well, why haven't we done anything about it? I can see it's only 50, 100 million dollars. Surely that's a bargain. And the same, you know, why haven't we built an interstellar spaceship? You know, they, they, <laughs> they may not have the entire science, but they've got the drive. So, yeah, I'm just going to can I show you that there are mods that extend the game. People build these massive bases. Do you want to build a starship? Well, turns out that somebody's built something called Interstellar Mod. Uh, Interstellar adds a whole bunch of features. You want to run a rocket on the moon? Well, somebody has uh, designed a rocket which uses aluminium and liquid oxygen. You know, you basically take your lunar regolith and split it up and you can get a rocket out of it. Nuclear light bulb engines, great, we've got those. Uh, deuterium, tritium, fusion drive, yep. And of course, the warp drive, yes. It's all in, oh, <laughs> I decided to include this one. This is, again, these are third-party mods that go on the original game. They're not developed by the developers of the game. They're developed by fans that have done extra research. They've built the models, they've incorporated. This, this one's great. I, I love it. Yeah, interstellar mod adds... You know, have you ever heard about an interesting uh, propulsion system? Somebody has gone and done the research and included it. Yeah, we also have the Kerbstein drive from you know, the Expanse. And they're not trivial. It's not like you're dropping in a black box. You know, somebody's actually modeling all these different flows. You know, you're, you've got a reactor that produces heat. It might produce charged particles. You might get electricity out that you're then using to... You know, yeah, somebody's gone and done all the research and all these different drive systems to you know, get their thrust or whatever. Look at this list of fuels, hydrogen, diborane, you know, liquid. Yeah. The amount of work just blows my mind continuously. Uh, ISRU, yep, ton of stuff. So the game, uh, you know, the mods tend to bring more detail and that means more fun, right? And more things to optimize, more things to get wrong, more things to research. And if you really want to go deep, then there are other games that have gone even deeper, I guess. And this is one I just want to bring up. It's not really a space exploration game, but it is advertised as the most scientifically accurate space warfare simulator ever made. And, you know, you have these kind of cigar-shaped spaceships with armor and radiators everywhere. You're having to do your correct uh, orbital mechanics to get your intercepts. You have you know, really beautiful armor modeling and internal structure and all that. This thing is doing like many, many layers of physics for each of these impacts. But <laughs> the modules, like it's literally, you know, you take your rocket motor and adjust your throat radius and your pressure and your pump sizes and it's, it's taking physics and it's modeling and it, it warns you in this case, by the way, that your, um, your fluorine methane rocket will probably cause your reaction, your combustion chamber to explode. Here's a, an example of a, a fission reactor. Again, designed in the game, you know, you're adjusting these, you've got, you know, different um, cooling loops and everything. Uh, and nuclear weapons, of course. You know, they're only fission-boosted weapons, they're not, uh, not proper fusion things. So, so all, out of all this, you know, games do have the potential to do amazing things in terms of education. What have I learned? What have they taught me? So I say that, you know, before I played any of these things, I thought that flying spacecraft was something that was entirely computers. There was no way humans could do half of these things. But, you know, right now, uh, yeah, I can land the lunar module like Neil Armstrong after a six-pack of beer. Like, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got thousands of hours doing all sorts. I navigate through extremely accurate, um, you know, uh, maneuvers. I can fly the Voyager stuff just because when you have good instrumentation, you can make all these decisions and you can make these burns. I also, I also discovered, yeah, many of these crazy ideas that people build, yeah, they existed in real life. And it's, I say crazy, a brilliant could also describe these. Every mistake that players make in sandboxes has had a real world version. And I've fundamentally, I've learned that kids can learn the most amazing things, like to fly Gemini 4 correctly. Uh, simulating science is a powerful way to teach it. And I get uh, a lot of feedback as well from fans basically telling me, you know, that they have playing this game or watching my videos has basically, they've 
turn them into actual rocket scientists. Many of these people are starting university courses. Some of them have actually started in the industry. This one I'm particularly embarrassed about because this guy started taking flying lessons and I have never had a flying lesson in my life. So I'm getting listed alongside Buzz Aldrin and I really am not worthy. <laughs> and uh, this is another one that I want to highlight. This is a physics teacher who, um, he started noticing a couple of years ago that there would be a few kids coming into his physics classes that were just way above grade level. And he thought that they were taking summer courses or everything. Eventually, after interrogating, we found out they were all playing this game. And they were coming in with not necessarily great understanding of the equations, but they understood action and reaction, right? It, it's like, you know, if you drive a car, everybody drives a car, right? You learn to drive. You don't learn the physics of where the rubber meets the road and the way the internal combustion engine works. You get this just seat of the pants understanding of how driving a car works. And the same is true if you fly a spaceship. You get the seat of the pants understanding, oh, that if you slow down your orbit, you're actually going to go faster. You know, you, it's experience. And the experience translates into real world skills. So why does KSP, Kerbal Space Program, succeed as a, an educational thing? I think it's because it's designed to be a game first. And the education qualities just emerge naturally out of the sandbox. And the consequences of those errors can be funny, and that's a great incentive to learn. When you explode your rocket, you don't feel dismayed. You feel like you want to go back and see if you can make it even more spectacular. And, but I've also learned that there are many, many, many games that have designed to be educational, and they, many of them just fail terribly because it's like, here's a boring thing where you load fuel into the rocket, and now let's read about the rocket equation. Like, they just walls of text with equations and things like that. You're not learning, you're getting, you're getting talked to, you're not learning. And yeah, Moonbase Alpha, I, Actually, Moonbase Alpha is interesting because it was a free thing produced by NASA to kind of talk to the public about the Moonbase. And what did happen was that there was a text-to-speech system in the game, and the players of it, <laughs> they actually learned to hack the text-to-speech engine and just made the astronauts run around singing all day. <laughs> so that's what they did learn. They didn't really learn very much about, you know, um, polar craters and uh, harvesting ice or anything like that. So uh, there's, there's a bunch of other science links. I don't know how we're doing on time. I should have started the... We're good? Okay, I've been going fast. So yeah, there's, there's other places where games have kind of worked their way into science. This one I like. We've got a... It was a slide from a SpaceX presentation. So we talk about the Apollo Command Module, the International Space Station, the NASA Mars Architecture, Image Credit, Kerbal Space Program. So yeah, no, we hadn't... He didn't render that or anything. He just built something in Kerbal Space Program, and that was his Mars architecture. Video games have actually made GPU hardware very, very cheap. And you can do some amazing processing on dedicated GPUs. So this is SpaceX simulating the combustion of a Raptor, I believe. This is a methane uh, oxygen engine. And this is being entirely simulated on games hardware. And it's so cheap now because games are a big industry. EVE Online, a game which I was talking about over lunch, they've, just, they've been doing something called Project Discovery, which allows their players during their downtime to participate in real science projects. EVE Online is kind of a hard, hardcore game, and there's a lot of time that players will just sit around doing nothing, waiting for something to happen. So they gave the players something to do, and right now you can analyze light curves from the Koro spacecraft. So these are spread out to everybody, and they'll get statistics on which uh, ones are apparently showing things. They just started this about a month ago, and we're starting to get data back. Prior to that, for about a year, they were doing cell classification. And from what I've heard, that has been an amazing success. They've got more uh, classifications than they previously got in your years of running their projects. There's also another angle that, remember how I talked about how gamers are problem solvers? There used to be something called, well, there's still something called folding at home, which would use your computer's spare processing power to calculate protein folding. Now, it came with this awesome screensaver that would show the proteins trying to get 
you know, solved by the algorithm, players started to complain that they would sit, look at this, and see that the computer was doing the wrong thing again and again and again. And so somebody developed something called Fold It, which kind of let the players influence the folding mechanism. They turned it into a game. And so this is actually somebody helping figuring out how a long chain of uh, you know, bases will then collapse down, or a long chain of amino acids will collapse down into a protein. Uh, and ultimately, with the help of thousands of players, they've actually written scientific papers. They've solved structures for proteins that had previously been resistant to computa pure computational techniques. Uh, and yeah, also, I'm just going to point out board games. They are getting in on the act as well. There's a bunch of other games that uh, I wanted to mention, but I'm skipping over. This is High Frontier. I heard that mentioned a couple of times. This is like everything we talk about, about moving out into the solar system and harvesting resources and technologies. This board game tries to do it all. It is unfortunately really hard to find because uh, nobody wants to sell their copies and there's no copies still on the market. You know, you can see the kind of the uh, cards that you get in the game with uh, well, various refineries. Ah, I'm trying to see these. Yeah, you get, you know, reactors and sails and just all the trappings. Actually, I heard the hackathon a couple of years ago. You tried to build a, you know, design a game as well. Yeah. So, you know, board games are having this amazing renaissance right now. And this is just one of many examples. So, yeah, gaming is this kind of way of making people pay attention to the science. And, you know, they're not necessarily going to solve any problems on their own, but the people that are playing them and doing these are coming out the other end with the skills that, um, that will facilitate it. Yeah, this is, this is often attributed to Benjamin Franklin, but no, he didn't say that. He might have said it, but he didn't say it first. So yeah, thanks. Fly safe. I'm sure you guys are all hungry and everything as well. I might go to the bar and have some food if you want to ask. <laughs> but anybody, any questions you want to ask in public? Okay. Here comes the mic. Okay, so how accurately does it simulate, does this Kerbal simulate the moon? I thought I heard you say it scales it down by a factor of 10 or something? Well, so yeah, if you have the stock game, it'll just do the, the, um, a one-tenth scale moon, very small. But uh, the surface gravity is actually scaled up. So they scale up the constant of gravitation, so you're still landing at one-sixth gravity. However, again, mods, uh, these are basically aftermarket modifications. You, you can have a full-scale moon with a, you know, everything to the correct scale, all the inclination problems that you have to deal with. Uh, full-on solar system. In fact, you can have other solar systems as well. Yeah, and, yeah. and could it, yeah, could it simulate the Lagrange dynamics? Uh, so that is one thing. The um, when they use time acceleration, they only use two-body forces, so they don't have Lagrange points. But again, there's some guy that has gone and made a mod. Uh, it's called. Um, oh, I forget what it's called, but basically, it adds full n-body gravitation for every planet. So uh, yeah, you can have your Lagrange points if you're prepared to go and hack your install. And they make it very easy to hack your install, I'll say. Uh, I, the, he is worried that basically Take-Two have not had a great history. The, well, basically Grand Theft Auto has had some issues with their mods being taken down. but. On the other hand, Take-Two also published a game called XCOM, which has had a massive mod scene, and they're totally supportive of it. So I don't see, I think it's down to the individual game developers. Okay. With that, we're going to break. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Scott.